Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is another fantastic series. I hope as ever you guys enjoy this one. Please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help build the channel and community. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled... I kill evil that the government does not want you to know about. Memoirs of an Army Ranger. Part 1. The Giants of Afghanistan. Let's get straight into that. I have seen and killed real evil. I'm not talking about people. Well... I've killed plenty of them too, but no man compares to real evil. No man is capable of the same atrocities and chaos that real evil inflicts. I hunted giants during my first deployment to Afghanistan, and they are the epitome of evil. I'm a US Army Ranger. I've been serving in bats for 12 years, and I've seen and killed the scariest shit imaginable. I haven't told anyone for fear of what would happen to my family and me. I lay awake most nights, wishing I could tell my wife what I've encountered, my mind and soul breaking from the weight I have to carry. I relive the horrors every night when I go to sleep. I've kept it all to myself until I found no sleep. I recognise many of the stories posted by my brothers in the spec ops and military communities and realised I'd finally had an outlet. I checked in on some of the posters to confirm they're all still breathing. I guess the government assumes that no sleep is fake, so they don't monitor it. What I'm about to share with you all is real. You deserve to know what lies in the shadows. You deserve to know what they're hiding from you. You deserve to know about the men and women that have sacrificed their lives to keep the forces of evil at bay. Skip the next few paragraphs if you are knowledgeable of the Spec Ops community. It's important that you have a basic understanding before I get to the crazy shit. I promise you that the stories that follow will be worth the wait. Army Rangers are a tier two spec ops unit, along with Green Berets, SF, SEALs, Marine Force Recon, and MARSOC. Tier one consists of CAG, Delta Force, DevGru, SEAL Team 6, and numerous groups that I won't speak about. There's value in being unknown to the world. We're often joined by tier 1 groups from around the world, which are usually the SAS, Brits, Aussies and Kiwis, and Joint Task Force 2, Canadians. Tier 2 consists of the top 1% of the military. Tier 1 generally only recruits the best from tier 2. We all train for years for selection slash qualification schools, and we all possess top secret security clearances, or higher. We're all very good at killing, and we will all forfeit our freedom or lives and possibly those of our families, if we share what we've done. Our government utilises Spec Ops units because we work in secret, we are the best, we're all well funded, and we can deploy anywhere in the world without congressional approval, declaration of war. You'd be shocked by how many countries and which countries that we're currently serving in. Our track record is impeccable, but usually closed to the public. I'm 34, a major and have been serving in BAT, Ranger Battalion 1st, 2nd, 3rd, for the past 12 years. I'm from Kansas City and a Mizzou grad. I'm currently attending a military school, CGSOC, at Fort Leavenworth, while I work on my PhD from Kansas State and await my next deployment to some hellhole. The good news is that I have plenty of time to share my experiences before I head back out. My first encounter with real evil happened during my first deployment to Afghanistan. It was 2009. I remember checking the computers in Kuwait while I waited a C-130 to take me to Bagram, Air Base in Afghanistan. I was excited the Chiefs had just signed Matt Cassell, thinking we'd be headed to the Super Bowl soon. Talk about naive. Anything to get my mind off of what awaited me. Death. Paralysis. Loss of limbs. I was 24 just a year out of college and didn't even have a serious girlfriend. I had a lot to live for, 
I pushed it out of my mind, leaning on the fact that I'd be leading the baddest motherfuckers on the planet. My rangers would get it done, and I'd make my bat and rangers proud. I flew into Bagram at 2200 with a couple of dozen other soldiers wearing our IOTVs, a bulletproof vest, and ACHs, Kevlar helmets. The C-130 was dark, only the dim green light illuminating the inside. Those around me glowed an alien green. The pilot gave us the warning to strap in as he began his descent, circling over the airfield and shooting flares to ensure no RPGs could hit us on the way down. Some fobbit whimpered and cried in the corner. One an NCO making eye contact with me yelled at the soldier to stop being a bitch as he rolled his eyes with a small grin. The ramp lowered, slamming hard onto the cement runway with a loud metallic crack. I grabbed my gear and head out in the dark. A huge Staff Sergeant SSG yelled, LT, get your shit and follow me. SSG Vasquez, six foot five and built like a brick shithouse. Shaved head, looking like a Hispanic version of the rock. He led me to the huge cup skated community on the base. It was a storage container which had three sleeping quarters divided by plywood. He told me to throw my gear on and head to the TOC, the Tactical Operations Center. The commander had a mission for me. I stood in the TOC in full gear, M4 hanging from my sling and Glock in my leg holster, looking at the dozens of TV screens and soldiers monitoring radios. The room was full of chatter, too much chatter. Something big was going on. My commander, Lieutenant Colonel LTC, Williams, introduced himself, telling me I was in the big leagues now. Shut the fuck up and do exactly what the captain, CPT Stone, told me. He then ushered me into a side room. I looked around and realised that this wasn't going to be a normal mission. SSG Vasquez sat at a table with eight others, sleeves bare, no range of scrolls. I realised it was an OAD, an eight-man team of Green Berets. My commander studied his brief. Team 329. Team hashtag S names changed to protect identities went missing four hours ago in a desolate portion of the Al Assay Mountains. Their transmission came in broken. They were escorting a CIA operative to a cave high in the mountains. We haven't been told anything else. We're sending in Team 357 to search and rescue. LT, you and Vasquez are tagging along. Your platoon is on mission for another few days. So, you're going to get some experience learning from CBT Stone and its team. The S2, Intel officer, stepped in and provided as much detail as he could for the mission while my commander pulled me out of the room. LT, we don't know what the fuck is going on. The CIA are being shitbags as usual. They have left the teams and us in the dark. I want you and Vasquez to gather as much intel as possible while you're there. These fuckers are getting our guys killed and we don't even know what for. I met CPT Stone and his team at their vehicles. Three H MMWVs that have been stripped down. They basically look like June buggies with miniguns mounted on the top. CPT Stone looked me in the eyes. He had a steely resolve, but there was a worry behind his eyes. He raised his hand above his head and said, LT, aim high. And I responded, Roger sir, headshots. Gathering that, he meant the enemy had full body armour on. He looked at me again, fiercely serious this time and fully extended his arm high above his head. No. Aim. High. I nodded, and we all loaded into the vehicles. Was he saying they'll hit us from the top of the cave? I remember thinking. I pushed it from my mind as we took off. We left Bagram, still pitch black, wearing MVGs as we rode through the hot desert night. I was constantly scanning the perimeter, waiting to be ambushed on the roads. I looked back at the huge bearded team guys. They were all looking straight ahead. They all seemed to know something that I didn't. They had zero concern for the road and seemed to be a million miles away in their minds. It was as if the real threat far exceeded what we'd seen from the Hajis en route. We hit the Al Assay Mountains a couple of hours later, pulling into a small combat outpost, COP, and dismounting. Ammo, grenades, water, and MVGs. Is that all of it? CP Stone said. I grabbed my assault pack as one of the team guys tossed me a few grenades and extra mags. We stepped off from the COP, moving up the mountain in a wedge formation. 
I remember thinking we were invincible as I looked at these huge warriors carrying M4s, SCARs, M2 sniper rifles and 203 grenade launchers. These guys had probably taken down entire Al Qaeda units by themselves. They had the look, the one you earn from taking the lives of other men. I felt like I was superhuman. Little did I know what awaited us. We came upon the cave just as the sun was cresting the mountain. The sky was blood red as darkness faded into oblivion. The cave looked like the mouth of a giant serpent and the opening was on the other side of the sheer ledge that stood 10 or 15 feet high. As we approached, CPT Stone said, eyes up, keep your distance. As we got within 100 meters of the cave, I saw something shiny on the ground. I signaled for the squad to halt and cancel CPT Stone over. It was a radio. The mic had been ripped off and the radio had a massive dent. Dried, black blood caked on the side of it. Chunks of skin and tissue littered the area. CPT Stone said, Shit, James, as his face turned to anger. He stood up as one of the team guys pulled out some climbing gear. He fastened it and we all climbed the ropes as silently as we could. I was last to climb, cresting the ledge and seeing the squad in a prone, pointing their weapons at the cave opening. As soon as I was up, the squad stood and started to move slowly toward the cave. E, one of the team guys, took point and took a few steps towards the cave. I was overcome with the worst smell imaginable, like sulphur, shit and rotten milk. I began to get an intense feeling of despair and hopelessness. It was an adrenaline rush and heightened senses of a normal engagement. It felt... it felt evil. Just as E put his hand up to motion for us to stop, I heard the deepest, loudest roar emanate from the cave. It sounded like a cross between a man yelling and the roar of a lion, but blended in an impossible manner. Before we knew it, something huge came charging out of the cave and impaled E with a massive spear, lifting him 15 feet off the ground. I looked in amazement at what looked like a huge man. It was absolutely massive, standing 13, 14 feet tall, its shoulders as wide as I am tall. It had long, red hair and a shaggy red beard. It had a loincloth on and leather sacks on its feet. We were all momentarily frozen and there was an absolute sense of pure, unbridled evil that emanated from this thing. Finally, CPT Stone yelled, Headshots! Headshots! And we all unleashed a barrage of rounds into its head and face. Nine soldiers, all emptying two to three magazines worth of ammo into the beast. It dropped E, who was still skewered on the spear and began to charge me, the ground shaking with every step. It looked at me with such cruelty and disdain open mouth revealing two rows of giant teeth. I felt like an ant that was about to be stomped on by a child. It yelled something in another language that I didn't understand. Its voice split in my eardrums. As it reached out its massive hand to grab me, it finally fell, riddled with bullets. Its head and face caved in. CPT Stone empties another magazine of 762s into the giant's head before going to check on E's body. It took three of us to lift the spear and another two to pull E's body off of the spear shaft, which makes a sucking noise as we pull him off. The spear had ripped out his entire chest cavity. His ribs were splintered and sticking straight out like crooked, jagged teeth. All of his internal organs lay in a pile on the desert floor. The five of us covered in his warm, sticky blood. CPT Jones called in the Citrep and requested transport. We all sat down for what seemed like an eternity of silence, and normally, after a mission we joke around and tell the most inappropriate stories. It's tradition that makes the horror of war feel a little more acceptable. Today, today was different. Every eye was glazed over, everyone sat facing away from the giant. We had seen, felt real evil. This thing was not a man. Being in its presence brought a feeling of hopelessness that I can't begin to describe. It was like all the joy, hope and good had been sucked out of the world and replaced by despair and agony. We finally stood up and examined the beast. It had six fingers on each hand. Its hands were large enough to wrap around my torso. and Its mouth revealed two rows of teeth, with each tooth being the length of my finger. The hair on its head and beard were an unnatural shade of red. I wrapped my hands around one of its fingers in an attempt to lift its arm. I couldn't even get its hand off the ground. The spear, still dripping with blood, 
weighed as much as the logs we used in training that required six men to lift above our heads. We stepped into the cave, seeing hundreds of human bones, chunks of skin, tissue and military uniforms litter in the pile. In the corner were hundreds of weapons, modern guns like M4s and FALs, rusted out AK-47s and ancient rotten swords, spears and shields. It's like, a, it's like it was keeping trophies. An unmarked Chinook showed up and 15 minutes later, a bunch of spooks, CIA ops, walked out. One said, grab the Neff. The team sergeant yelled, fucking clowns, thanks for the intel. The agents never made eye contact and they unloaded a forklift and cargo net, wrapping up the beast and loading him into the Chinook. CPT Stone motioned for me to come over. I asked if he was doing his closure report. A brief officers have to fill out to summarise battles. He said no. No, wait for it. Shortly after, one of the agents walked over and pulled out a piece of paper. It was a pre-filled closure report detailing how we had been ambushed by Al-Qaeda. He had been killed before we scared them off. He said, sign here. CPT Stone signed and motioned for me to do the same. With a threatening look, the agent said, you can never speak of this. He turned to walk away and I asked, what's a Neff? He paused momentarily and then walked off. When we returned to Bagram, we did a full debrief. Some spooks sat in the corner the entire time to ensure we didn't speak about the giant. After my brief, my commander told me to shower and meet him at the smoke pit in 20 minutes. Ditch your electronics. LTC Williams handed me a cigar as I approached the smoke pit. He asked me what I had actually seen on the mission, and then explained to me that six other teams had encountered these giants. Most were less lucky than we were. He informed me that he was trying to figure out what the hell they were. And he did eventually. But that's a story for another day. My first engagement with a giant set off a chain of events that brought me to the truth of those evil beings and many others. After the mission was over, I was approached by one of the team guys. He removed his hat to reveal a kipper underneath. Sir, do you want to know what the thing said to you when it charged? He said. I nodded without hesitation. It said, Son of Yisha, I will eat your soul. He then looked at me in the eye and said, We've killed a dozen of these things. We're figuring out what they are. It's not good. Head out with us on a mission tomorrow, and I'll fill you in. I kill the evil that the government does not want you to know about. Memoirs of an Army Ranger. Part 2. Task Force M. Let's get straight into that. I think that evil hiding in the dark has always existed. It seems like they've come forward in recent decades. Maybe it's technology, an explosion of population, or maybe it's something else. Maybe they've been unleashed. What I'm about to share is 100% true and a vital part of the fight against the Neff and other creatures. You deserve to know that there are elements within the government that are fighting for you. You also deserve to know that small elements within the government are working against you. Will you be ready to fight? Day 2 in Afghanistan, 2009 I dreamt the most vivid and lucid dream last night, after we killed the beast. I was dead, standing in some unnatural place. It was pitch black, stretching for an eternity. The only light in this place emanated from my body. I felt like I was floating, like my body did not physically exist. I ran in every direction, screaming for help, never seeing another soul or light. I finally gave up, sitting down, ready to spend an eternity in isolation. I suddenly began to sense the same fear and despair that I felt in the presence of the giants we had killed. Please God, no! I thought. On cue, the giant walked out of the darkness. It looked the same, but its eyes were now yellow with red pupils. It bent down to look me in the eyes, licking its lips and giving me a look of disgust. And it said, You sent me to this place. You and your filthy God. Now that you're here, I will make you pay for eternity. 
As its hand was inches from snatching me up, I saw a flash of light dart between us. I shot upward, hearing the beast yell a guttural cry of agony. I was suddenly back in my bed, drenched in sweat, feeling like I'd just gone somewhere I should have not been. Vasquez, asleep in the other room, awoke to the sound of freedom being delivered at March 2nd. The shipping container? I am in rattle so hard that my gear falls off the hooks on the wall. Bagram is one of the two main US coalition air bases in Afghanistan, so jets and bombers take off at all hours of the day and night. SSG Vasquez yells, Son of a bitch! Shut the hell up! as he throws something at the ceiling, leaning over my less than sturdy plywood wall, smiling and stroking my hair. Wake up, young one. I threaten to bash his skull in, knowing full well he can snap me like a twig. He laughs and slowly lowers below the plywood. I throw my leg holster on, pulling my Glock out. I release the mag, ejecting the chambered round, catching it midair, and pushing it into the top of the mag with my thumb. I tap the mag on the side of my ACH and pull it back into the pistol with a resounding click, leaving it in green stasis. I holster it on my right thigh and quickly check to ensure my gear, weapons and grenades are in place, grabbing my patrol cap and heading out into the heat. The sun is barely up and the temperature is already in the mid-90s. My fire-resistant ACUs make it feel 20 degrees hotter and I squint, keeping my eyes down to avoid the rising sun while putting my Oakleys on. In the daylight it becomes apparent that I stick out like a sore thumb. Everyone around me wears whatever they want. Most have baseball caps on and have beards. Some have uniforms on with no identifying patches. Some wear cargo pants and polos. I am one of the few in ACUs. My back scroll on my left arm, clean shaven and short hair. Rangers are one of the few spec ops units that wear uniforms and abide by shaving hair lengths standards. I am 24 and a second lieutenant, 2LT. The gold bar on my chest might as well be a bullseye. Bearing a 2LT in bats is like being a freshman that is a captain of the varsity football team. I technically outrank the enlisted soldiers and NCOs, but I lean heavily on them for my mentorship. I prepare myself for the daily hazing rituals, knowing I'd better be ready to laugh at myself. I step into the TOC to check in with LTC Williams, who is leaning over a soldier staring at a computer screen that is showing troop movements. Activity in the TOC is much slower today. Most soldiers stand behind screens, dipping or drinking coffee. Some are talking about football, others look like zombies in need of a break. The place feels different than the night before. I wonder how much they actually know about what happened the previous night. They couldn't know, or they wouldn't be at peace. There's no going back from what I saw. It was weighing on me, heavily. LTC Williams interrupts my thoughts, nodding at me and motioning for me to follow him. He is tall, six foot four thin, with grey and hairs on his temples. He looks like he's probably run marathons, but has a slight limp. Word is that he lost most of his right calf in an IED improvised explosive device, attack. He still walks so fast that I had to power walk to keep up with him. He pulls me into the conference room and tells me to sit down. LT, CPT Stone told me you did a great job last night and that I can trust you. The way he said trust you led me to believe there was more behind what he was saying. I'm giving first platoon to another lieutenant that's en route. I start to object but he holds a hand up to stop me. This is not a punishment. You'll get a platoon, eventually. For now, you're taking over the PSD team. And you'll augment some of the team guys while they're recovering from the last few months. He gives me a look of reassurance that lets me know there is more to this. I thank him and accept my fate. He tells me to get unpacked and settled and that they'll find me for the next mission. He hands me a phone saying, it's secure. Well, it's secure from the Hajis. I wonder what he means by secure from the Hajis. I didn't understand who else we needed to cure comms from at that time. I leave the TOC dejected. PSD are the three letters that most don't want to hear when deployed. PSD stands for Personal Security Detachment. It's the military's less fancy version of what you see the Secret Service doing on TV. It's a great job when you're in a garrison. I've planned and led the security for multiple presidents and even for the Queen of England during visits throughout the West. but. While well deployed, I want a platoon. I want to be the blunt instrument, not the bulletproof vest. I couldn't shake the feeling I got from him, though. 
He was trying to tell me something. And telling me I was augmenting team guys was really strange. That's not typically something an officer would do. We're leaders and managers, not extra guns. Also, team guys normally don't get augmented unless something catastrophic happens. The next month went by in a blur, as I spent 16 hours a day escorting general officers and high-ranking politicians around Afghanistan. I sat in on meetings that decided the fate of the nation. I fought through a couple of attacks on our principals, VIPs, narrowly missed a VB IED, a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device, and even took a round to the arm, just a graze, but left a badass scar. None of it seemed to matter though, it wasn't even exciting. I spent most days thinking about what the giant was, and thinking that I should be hunting the real evil of this world. It's like the Neff left a scar on my soul. I just couldn't shake it from my thoughts. And where the hell was David and 357? He said he would talk to me about the giants that had killed, but I haven't seen him since my first night in country. Then something happened that changed my life forever. A few guys walk into my office. Two of the guys look completely out of place. They have khakis and black polos on. They say CBTI. Both are a bit plump. They aren't CIA operatives and clearly aren't soldiers. The third is a spook. He has on cargo pants, a black polo and a black cap. He has the look. Spooks stick out like a sore thumb. The spook shakes my hand and takes his cap and sunglasses off, introducing himself as Jake. He looks like a legitimately good guy. He has balding grey hair, is about 5'10", and has the friendliest smile you'll ever see. He looks like everyone's favourite uncle. He isn't being distant and isn't talking to me like I'm a retard. A far cry from the CIA asshats that I have interacted with thus far. He looks me in the eye and says, Mike, I'm going to be needing you and Vasquez for the next couple of months to run security for an operation we have going on. It's jarring to hear my first name. As far as I know, only LTC Williams is aware that my name is Mike. I try to hide my angst and ask, what for sir? What's the mission? I need to run it by LTC Williams since we're the only dedicated SOC OM PSD team in the area. He says, absolutely, run it by your boss, but it's already settled. He's aware. He's avoiding my question about the mission. What's the mission in town? I've got a 10-man team, so I need specifics to allocate the proper number of personnel, I said. Jake responded, just you and Vasquez. These gentlemen will fill you in on the mission. He gets up and gives me a very nerdy fist bump, smiling and says, I'll see you boys at 1900. Meet me at the helipads. We're going to be working nights. He then walks out of the TOC without glancing back. The other two guys fill us in on the basics. We're going to be dropping orbs around the country to uh, test out the new technology we developed. I know at that point to stop asking questions. I'm not going to get anything from them. They leave the TOC and Vasquez gives me a funny look. I ask, who the hell were those two? Jake is clearly a spook, but those two look like they work for my uncle's engineering firm. Vasquez filled me in on CIA contractors. The three-letter agencies hire a lot of civilians for technology, development, implementation and intelligence gathering. CIA contractors are much more rampant than you realise. If you've worked at a major engineering firm or technology provider to the DoD, than you've worked with or for someone that has been contracted by the CIA at some point. You've clearly picked up on the distrust or outright animosity between the spec ops community and CIA. It's not always that way. There are a lot of great CIA agents that try and take care of us. The problem is that a majority of joint CIA spec op missions leave one side wanting for intel. And that's always the spec ops side. We're generally treated like blunt instruments whose only value it's a hammer and nail. I distrust them, even if they hadn't fucked us over by failing to inform us of the giant. Our missions and core beliefs are just vastly different. The Spec Ops community works in the shadows to eliminate threats to the United States and our allies. We can't publicly share what we do, but we have zero interest in misleading the general public. I don't want you to have to worry about the evil people and creatures of this world, but honestly, I'd like for that to be your choice. When dealing with the Nefs, there were good and bad elements within the CIA and other three-letter agencies. It just took us a while to see which side most were on. 
I talked to LTC Williams, who confirmed what Jake had said. Vasquez and I were tasked out to take Jake and his team for the next couple of months. He said something strange as I was leaving the TOC. LT, Jake is one of the good guys. Trust him entirely and ensure he comes back in one piece. I step out into the bright sun, throw my patrol cap and Oakley's on. I stare off into space, thinking about what he said. Why would he tell me a CIA agent is one of the good guys and to trust him entirely? Aren't we all on the same team? The CIA can be dicks, but they're still on our side, right? I meet Jake on the helipad at 1900. The sun is starting to go down. I recognise the gunner. He was in the 160th helicopter that picked us up after we killed the giant. He nods at me as we board the Black Hawk. The road just pushes upward, the helicopter rocking forward a bit as we're lifted to a few hundred feet in the seconds, the nose stabilising as we speed forward. There is always something comforting about riding in Black Hawks. For some reason, I get a better rush from leaning out the door than I do jumping out of a plane. It doesn't hurt that the 160th has the best pilots in the world. My pilot, John, is a Warrant Officer 3 and an artist in the sky. We shoot forward, flying NOE, nap of the earth, 200 miles per hour, just above the tree line. I clip a carabiner to my belt and pants and leaning out the door, feeling like I could reach down and touch the treetops. We snake in and out of the canyons, helicopter pitch black as John flies only aided by NODs. We travel for about an hour as I hear Jake say, right here, put it down above the cave. We step out of the bird. Vasquez and I sprinting in opposite directions, diving into the prone and facing the tree line. One of the engineers pulls a small robot out that looks like the kind you see bomb squads use in the States. Using a remote control, he wheels it down the cave opening. It's carrying a large crate of small orbs that look like they're full of wiring. The robot returns and we all load the Black Hawk, flying up into the brisk mountain air. Periodically, the engineers drop loads of orbs off the side of the Black Hawk. No one speaks the entire trip, they just monitor their computers, which Vasquez and I aren't allowed to view. This happened every night for the next couple of months. For 12 hours refuel time, we headed out over the countryside, dropping orbs and sending a robot into caves. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Vasquez and I were frustrated because we were wasting valuable time in country, staring at the tops of trees and pulling security for a robot. Most nights we didn't even return to Bagram. We landed at some desolate FOB, leaving from there the following night. Jake would smoke cigars with me after missions. He'd talk about his family back home or about how he joined the CIA to protect America and reveal the truth. Truth with a capital T, he would say. He had a necklace, a crucifix with rosary breeds that was always wrapped around his wrist. He constantly fidgeted with the crucifix between his fingers. It was like he was always nervous of some unseen force. He talked to me about my high school, which made me supremely uncomfortable at first because no one knew where I'd gone. It was a private Christian high school in Missouri. He'd talked to me about how I had played football and basketball there. We'd have philosophical debates about Christianity since he was a Catholic and I was a Protestant. Always respectful and always interesting. I'm not sure when it happened, but he became like an uncle to me. At the end of our conversations, he would always pause and look me in the eye. He wanted to tell me something about the mission, but just couldn't do it. One night, once we were nearly complete with the mission, he came to my hooch late at night. It must have been 0200. The only activity on the COP was soldiers pulling security in the towers and fighting positions. He tells me to ditch my electronics and rub some sort of wand over me, like security in an airport. When we walk outside the COP, which makes me highly uncomfortable, we aren't exactly in Missouri. He walks over to a shallow cavern and drops a few of the orbs that we have been leaving around the country. I watch as a small green light comes on in each one. They suddenly roll forward, spacing out and coming to a rest at the opposite ends of the cavern. Sitting on a rock, he pulls out his laptop and motions for me to look. It was the cavern we were sitting by. It was like staring at a 360 degree picture online. The cavern was completely mapped out. He moves a joystick, steering his way around the cavern. I could see a great detail, the granite walls and even the small bugs that were flying around. 
frozen in midair. And it finally dawns on me as I look at him. Holy shit, we've been mapping the caves of Afghanistan, he says. Yep, it's not perfect, but some of the deeper caverns have dark spots, but it's still a start. My team thinks we covered about 30% of the cave systems. I'm blown away. This is going to be huge. Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. We're going to make some major progress in a war on terror. He looks at me and raises his hand above his head, just like CPT Stone had before battling the giant. Think bigger, he says, grabbing his computer and heading back to camp. The next morning, Jake grabs Vasquez and me, telling us we're going to see a friend. We borrow a vehicle from the Kiwis responsible for the area, driving into a tiny village a couple of hours away from the COP. Jake dismounts, motioning for us to follow him into a small home. An elderly Afghan man, long, white beard, head wrap on, smiles, saying something in Dari. Jake gives him a hug and responds. We sit down at a table for the traditional Afghan foods. We spend an hour with small talk, Jake translating the entire time. The Afghan elder finally says, You have new friends? You want me to tell them about the beast? Jake nods, looking at me. He says, Asadi is an elder of this village and a dear friend of mine. He led me on the path I'm on. He introduced me to the giants when I was about your age. And Asadi begins his story, Jake translating. My village has always feared the beast. We have always feared the night. We all go inside when the sun sets, even pulling our animals into our homes. He motions toward a goat that's standing outside. The beast has always done what it wanted. No man could stop it. When I was young, a young man of 15, I thought the elders were just trying to scare us. I had never seen the beast, so two of my friends and I went to explore the countryside at night. It felt very freeing to no longer fear the stories of my elders. We explored for hours, enjoying the cool air of the night. The grass was wet with dew as we ran up and down the hills near our village. His facial expression changes to sadness. We are at the top of one of the forbidden hills, and we are overcome with a terrible smell. We were all frozen in fear. We feel it in here. He points at his chest. Suddenly, a very large man, like two of us, puts his hand above his head, grabs one of my friends. My friend screams in pain and fear, and the beast crushing him, his bones loudly popping. The creature then bites down on my friend, ripping his body in half. He chews the top half, with loud cracking on every bite. He swallows and drops his legs on the ground. The beast looks at me, speaking in a language I do not understand. The only word I recognize is my name. It then grabs my other friend, smashing him flat on the ground blood pooling underneath. The giant stands over me and yells like a lion, and then grabs what's left of my friends and walks off, chewing on one of their legs as it goes. The elder is crying at this point. He says, I waited every night for the beast to come back for me. Some years we heard nothing of it. Some years entire families disappeared from their homes. We always felt the ground shaking and heard the roar like a lion. Every time I heard my name yelled, between the splintering and cracking of homes being destroyed, I was always too afraid to reveal myself. I can still hear the crunching of my friend in his mouth. He then looks at Jake with a small smile. Until Jake. Jake and the other Americans found and killed the beast many years ago. I've slept soundly for many years now. We thank Asari for the food and give him gifts. Jake gives him a hug and says the Pashto word for friend as we leave. We head back to the COP, not saying a word. All that I could think of was the giant's yellow eyes. My heart was pounding with rage for the innocent people of Asari's village. The next morning, Jake informs me that we're done mapping for now. He puts an arm around me and walks me around the corner of the sleeping quarters. Mike. I've enjoyed our talks. I informed LTC Williams that you and Vasquez did an awesome job and that I trust you entirely. He reaches out and slides something in the breast pocket of my ACUs, saying, Go see LTC Williams before closing the Velcro. 
John will take you to him. LTC Williams has a new mission for you. Welcome to M. I must have looked extremely confused. He smiles and gives me one of his patented nerdy fist bumps and walks off. We descended toward a COP in the most remote part of Afghanistan. Jagged mountains littered the landscape, snow covering the peaks. The Black Hawk dips sharply as we pass through two peaks and into a small clearing, landing within the walls of a COP. I had just spent the last couple of months flying all around Afghanistan. I never saw this COP or these peaks. I had no idea where we were. It was placed in the most counterintuitive fashion possible. It was at the base of a hidden pass, sheer cliffs all around. There were only a few pilots I knew that would risk landing in a place like this. We were on the low ground. An enemy ambush would leave us defenceless. The rotor slowly winds down as we step out of the helicopter. David is there to meet me. He has a huge smile on his face, which is weird for Team Guys. His patrol cap off, only his kipper covering his head. Welcome to FOB Exodus, he says, nodding at the pilot and door gunner. He grabs my bag for me and ushers SSG Vasquez and I to the TOC, which looks like every other shitty TOC and a desolate outpost. Maps and TV screens littering the walls and soldiers sitting at tables monitoring radios. The odd part is that two huge team guys stand in the back of the TOC, each at the low ready with weapons. David says, all good guys. And they push the shelf to the side. It makes a loud grinding noise as it begrudgingly slides across the floor. Where the shelf used to be is a staircase. David says, I hope you're ready to be tortured, with a smile. He motions for us to follow, leading us to a door at the bottom of the stairs. He knocks three times and waits for a voice to call him in. I follow him into a large conference room with a huge table in the middle. LTC Williams stands in front of a TV screen, conducting some sort of intel brief. A dozen guys sit at the table. I recognise CPT Jones, a few team guys, and a CIA agent from Bagram. There are a few SAS officers, two Brits and an Aussie. A Canadian, JTF2, NCO, and an ANA, Commando, Afghan. On the end sat an Israel Commando, who I would later learn served in Sayaret. The wall has TV screens, dry erase boards and cork boards. All are littered with pictures of creatures. Most look like the giant we killed, labelled Nephilim Raphaim. Other terrifying creatures litter the wall. There are maps with red tacks, signifying targets. One cork board has pictures of what looks like angels and Greek gods. It's labelled Watchers, Fallen Angels. SSG Vasquez takes a seat at the table, winking at me and smiling. LTC Williams says, Welcome back, Vasquez. He turns to me and says, Welcome to the Task Force, M. We've decided we can trust you entirely. Are you ready to kill real evil? I kill evil that the government does not want you to know about. Memoirs of an Army Ranger Part 3 Giants of Afghanistan Beginnings Let's get straight into that. I was randomly pulled out of class, military school I'm attending today, which is highly unusual since the general officers don't even interrupt coursework. Some guy in a suit talked to me and said he wanted to meet me face to face. It was a really weird interaction. The guy had a creepy, sleazy vibe. He wasn't a CIA operative and definitely wasn't a soldier. He never introduced himself and never said why he was talking to me. I think we all know why though. I'll try to get the rest of the stories up over the next week or two. Screenshot them if you want to keep them for reference. There is a possibility that they'll disappear at some point. It won't be my doing. Part 3 is David's first interaction with a Neff. It was using them like a war club. I swear to God, then it started to eat them. J. Afghanistan, 2009. Moments after part two. Whose turn is it? LTC Williams says, looking around the massive conference room. LT, I know you must have questions. We'll get to them soon. Fixing his gaze on me. 
David moves to the front of the room, snapping to attention. I think it's me, sir. LTC Williams tells him to stop being a smartass and get started. David smiles and begins his story. There I was, just a young sergeant. It was the summer of 2001. I was on Team 177. They were much cooler than my current teammates. You know, since we were MFF, military freefall. The room boos. As CPT Stone throws an empty can of Rip It at David's head, he continues with a smile. These guys were true warriors. I was pretty sure they would find Bin Laden by themselves. I was just a young sergeant. First team. I was in awe. I was invincible. He looks at me with understanding. Anyway, we had been rolling out on missions for about six months. Afghanistan was the Wild West. Limited FOBs and resupply was a bitch. We were all over the south, running reconnaissance. He used his fingers to make quotations. We were in and out of Kandahar, which was absolutely overrun by Taliban fighters. Every recon turned into a tactical retreat. Well, after we dropped about a million pounds of ordnance, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Until the Hajis moved into the caves. We killed a lot of evil sons of bitches. The weird part was that it took them months to move into the caves. It was like they were afraid to go underground. Even with the Predators and B4s bombing them back to the Stone Age, they just stayed out in the open. Afghans aren't stupid. They come from a long lineage of fighters. They've been fighting for 2,000 years. They stopped Alexander the Great in his tracks. The Soviet Union got sick of fighting these fuckers. But it was like they lost all tactical bearing. It took them months to move everyone underground and we didn't understand why. One day, we received a mission to reconnoitre a cave system east of Kandahar. We were told that some Taliban HVT, high value target, was operating a cell in a system of caves. Air support was unable to penetrate far enough underground to flush them out. We step off from the COP, travelling only at night. Iran hadn't snuck in many NVGs to the terrorist cells at the time, so we were able to move unimpended. We followed the Afghan Dab River for a few days, setting up a patrol base a few clicks from the cave, sending two three-man teams out to establish LP OPs, listening and observation post, monitoring the movements in and out of the cave. One of the LP OP teams comes back one night, sprinting into the patrol base, muttering, Rangers, the running password. David looks at me and says, don't get any ideas. It wasn't you, Slackjaws. It was the baseball team, he said with a grin. He pauses to collect his thoughts and starts again, looking back at the room. So, the three-man team runs into the patrol base. They look like they've just seen a ghost. Jay, one of the bravos, says, It was fucking eating them. He is breathing heavily and panicked. I ask, What are you talking about? Calm down. Jay takes a few deep breaths and throws some dip in his bottom lip and then starts again. For 48 hours, we watched Hajis, armed with AKs and RPGs, go in and out of the cave. Uh, there must have been 50 total. A few hours ago, the cave suddenly sounds like it's the 4th of fucking July. We see the Hajis sprinting out of the cave, screaming, stumbling over each other, scared to death, man. Suddenly, uh, there was a loud roar. I, I swear to God, I felt the ground shake as this thing moved. He paused to spit. This thing, it comes out of the cave and it's just annihilating the Hajis. It must have been three times their size. It's ripping through them like butter. It sideswipes a group of them with its arm, knocking them against the wall. It grabs a Haji in each hand and squeezes. Their bodies explode, heads popping from the force. I swear, I swear I could hear their bones break from our position 200 meters away. It grabs one of the fighters, the RPG shooting straight up, snaking off into the distance. It uses the man as a fucking war club, I swear to God. It smashes the fighter's body against half a dozen men before biting him in half and swallowing. The ten Hajis that were left sprinted out of the cave and into the forests. I am pretty sure they're still running. CPT Holmes, the team captain, looks Jay in the eyes waiting for him to say if it was all a joke. Nothing. Jay stares back at us, eyes completely glazed over. The other two witnesses nod in unison to confirm Jay's story. 
CPT Holmes stands up, walking away with his radio, speaking to Hire, who inform us to maintain our current position and wait for direction. A couple of hours later, CPT Holmes informs us that we're heading into the cave. We're to kill anyone and anything in there. And Jay, completely out of character, yells at the captain. Are you fucking serious? It took down 50 men, like it was killing ants. CPT Holmes nods, understandably, only saying, we leave in 20. Dave pauses, like he was catching something in his throat, and starts again. We leave our rucks at the patrol base, camouflaging them the best we can, and then head out into the darkness. We walk using only our NODs, because it's fucking pitch black on a mountain. A green haze replaces the darkness. The trees and fallen logs look like shadows. The entire movement, all I can think about, is becoming food for some unknown beast. MVGs and lack of sleep make me hallucinate the entire trip. Everyone in the room nods, because we've all been there. Every fucking tree looks like a huge creature. Every branch looks like an arm reaching for me. We walk down the mountain, Jay leading us to another LP, OP team's position. We find nothing but blood, weapons, and caissons. I take points and step into the mouth of the cave, which must have been 30 feet tall. We flip our NODs up on their mounts and turn on our surefire flashlights, since there wasn't enough ambient light in the cave for the MVGs to be effective. This cave, this cave is absolutely massive. We're in full wedge formation, spread out about 60 meters total and still have room on either side. We step over the arms, legs and torsos of dead Hajis as we move. I can hear the splosh of pulled blood under my feet. Bones crunch as we step, heel to toe, heel to toe. We see tables and communication gear, all within a couple of hundred meters of the cave opening. The Hajis were afraid to go deeper, yet our dumbasses were doing just that. We continue walking for at least an hour before the smell overcomes us. It smells like corpses and shit. He looks at us as we nod in unison. He has tears in his eyes and starts again. You'll never forget the first time you feel that fear. It comes over you like a total tidal wave, moving from head to toe until your body stops working. I instantly know something is wrong. I try to tell the team to halt, but nothing comes out of my mouth. We instinctively pull in tighter and face outward. A flashlight darting back and forth against the pitch black walls. I see the rigid of these ancient caves and giant stalagmites. Suddenly, what I think is a wall begins to move, and my flashlight catches this enormous beast. It looks like a man, but it's at least 15 feet tall. Its head and hands look disproportionate to its body, absolutely massive. It turns its head towards me, peeking around a cavern wall, its eyes glowing unnaturally from my flashlight. Smiling, it speaks in ancient Hebrew. Israelite, I hate his chosen. With the most menacing look on its face, the evil is nothing you can see on a human, no matter how terrible they are. It bends down and flicks me, I swear to GD. It flicks me like a human would flick a bug. The blow knocks me backward and against the wall, and the creature laughing so loud that the cavern shakes. The team opens up on the beast. He pauses, as I can hear the regret in David's voice. We are totally unprepared. The entire team shoots centre mass. I mean, that's what we are taught our entire lives. It does absolutely nothing. The creature grabs CPT Holmes and throws him against the wall, killing him instantly. It bites down on Jay's neck, snapping his head off in its mouth. Jay's headless body slumps to the floor. Blood pours down its lips, smiling while it chews. It looks at me and says, Having fun yet, Jew? Where's your god now? One by one, the team falls. I am the last one standing, having expended all of my ammo. I fall to my knees and begin to pray. The ground shakes as it slowly walks towards me, chewing on one of my teammates' arms. The beast is taking its time. It's taunting me. The thing picks me up around the torso, breaking three of my ribs and bringing me to eye level. It then says, I will let you live because you are weak and useless. You who are made in your God's image. 
You will remember me when you sleep, and you will seek death. It then tosses me to the floor, knocking the wind out of me. The beast gathers what's left of my team and walks deeper into the cavern. I scream for it to kill me. It just laughs maniacally and disappears into the dark. I spent the next six hours walking back to the patrol base. I was finally picked up by a medivac chopper. You know the rest. CIA agents are on board and don't let my story see the light of day. They threatened me with prison time and death. All that I wanted was to get onto another team to avenge my brothers. Now, I'm here, five years later, with you assholes. And I did avenge my team. We avenged my team. And for that, I thank you. I'm going to have a smoke now. I kill evil that the government does not want you to know about. Memoirs of an Army Ranger. Part 4. Fallen Angel. Let's get straight into that. Afghanistan, 2009. Task Force M. Cop Exodus. This thing was massive. It was at least 50 feet tall. Its wings spread, filling up the cavern. Its voice shook the ground. My marines went crazy and started killing each other. The conference room I sat in had 37 chairs, each with a different nameplate. I didn't recognise the names, and they sounded like ancient Hebrew. LTC Williams said, Welcome to Task Force M. We research and kill the enemies of mankind, those things that hide in the shadows, that campfire stories were created about. From now on, you will be referred to as Ben and Aya. Ben for short. Never use real names when referring to task force members. We don't know who to trust. The last man to hold your seat died in a most terrible manner, but he did so while saving his brothers. His memory and contributions to the safety of humanity will never be forgotten. The dozen operators seated pounded the table three times in unison. LTC Williams told David to give me the tour of FOB Exodus as he went back to briefing the rest of the team. David hit my shoulder smiling in excitement as he took me out of the conference room. There are four wings connected to the conference room with COP Exodus. Each represents an evil that our task force has encountered. Each is used to research and teach about those entities. The end state is to figure out how to kill them effectively and figure out what their plans are for humanity. Generally two TFM members are responsible for each wing. Wing 1 is all about the big guys. That giant you helped take down was one of them. We believe they're Nephilim or Raphaim. Keep in mind that everything we learn is theory. We base it on first-hand accounts, scripture, and other ancient texts and legends. All seem to contain stories of giants. It's hard to prove these things aren't what we believe, because they're not exactly easy to have a conversation with. He said with a chuckle. Ira, the Israeli commando, and I are in charge of this wing mainly because we can both read and understand ancient Hebrew and translate early scripture and texts. Wing 2 covers fallen angels in physical form. Two Force Recon Marines run that wing. They had a crazy ass encounter with one. I'll take you to Ab to see if he'll tell you about his encounter in Iraq. So far, I've spent a lot of time studying the area around the Euphrates and the Arctic underground. Wing 3 is spiritual. We don't mess with that shit much. We have a few chaplains that take care of that. Have you had any weird experiences or night terrors since taking down the Neff? I nodded as he continued. Completely normal. These creatures seem to have a spiritual impact on us. It's like they can track our souls and continue to harass us after they're gone. Wait until you have an interaction while you're awake. That shit fucks with your mind. So, we have chaplains that do spiritual warfare for us. Some of our braver members do it themselves. Talk to that big Scottish bastard in an SAS uniform. He'll take care of any issues if a chaplain isn't around. Wing 4 is aliens. He pauses and looks at me sheepishly before continuing. Look, people seem to be willing to believe the spiritual side or scientific side. They think we're crazy when we start talking about both. 
Different members have strong opinions on what the aliens really are. Some believe they're demons, fallen angels. Some believe they are from other planets. Some believe they are both. All that we know is that they are evil and view us like animals. We have a couple of CAG Delta guys that take care of that wing. They both worked in Dulce AFB, Air Force Base, and swear that there are miles of tunnels underground there that house a few alien species, the Grey, Reptilians and Nordics. Now, apparently, those two were part of a massive battle there because the aliens were keeping humans as experiments and food. The interesting part was that they saw a few Neff delivered to Dulce. Most were immediately handed over to the Nordic species. I'll get into more details about the Four Wings eventually, but I think the easiest way for you to understand is for you to hear the first-hand accounts from the SMEs, Subject Matter Experts. Let's head to Wing 2. I'll see if I can entice the Force Recon Marines to tell you their story. I'll offer them a snack. They seem to like crayons. He laughed way too hard at his own joke and told me to follow him to Wing 2. The two Marines were sitting behind computers in Wing 2, researching what looked like Greek gods when I walked in. Pictures of angels, demons and gods were plastered all over the walls. Names were posted next to most. Maps of Antarctica and the Middle East hung from a corkboard. Tacks were stuck in different spots and had red strings leading from the tacks to pictures. One picture was hand-drawn, yarn leading to a rack. Near the Euphrates River, the word asshole was written under that picture. It was the only picture that was hand-drawn, and I found myself drawn to it like a moth to flame. Staring at the charcoal outline of what looks like an angel, head down, resting on its hands. The world seemed to disappear as I tried to see the angel's eyes under its cloak. I was finally snapped out of it to the sound of laughing. Davy was holding a box of crayons for the marines, who told him that he's lucky he's too pretty to beat up. One of the marines tossed me a blue and silver rippet and told me to take a seat. He grabbed a can of skull, shaking it a few times before pulling a pinch out and stuffing it into his bottom lip, and then started talking. We got stuck with the names that no one can pronounce, so everyone just calls me Ab, he says while laughing. We're also stuck with a most difficult wing. There have been very few encounters with what I refer to as angels. I believe they're fallen angels. I don't really have the best understanding of how they came to be chained, or why they're still in physical form, but I'm working on that. We got stuck in this wing because we both encountered one during the initial invasion of Iraq. We were the first ones in. Shittiest equipment, man. We didn't even have up-armoured HMMWVs, Humvees. We were rolling in those soft skins every day, every squad, and clear out the dam to ensure no Iraqis were hiding in there. The plant manager promised us that no one was left, but we had to make sure. So, we grabbed a couple of Iraqis and tried to take them with us and lead us through the dam. These guys shit themselves. They fell to the ground, sobbing and begging us not to make them go back in. We assumed that they were worried we were going to execute them. Then we realised that they preferred death to going back in a dam. They were begging us to kill them. Finally, the plant manager, an elderly guy, spoke to us and said, He'd take us if we need to leave the workers outside. We agreed and began our clearing operations. I had a squad of seven with me, plus our LRS long range surveillance team, loaded up with some serious firepower just in case we got hit. We go from the bright Iraqi sun into the dimly lit dam. The door makes a loud creak as we enter. This place is fucking massive. We take a set of staircases down the dam, which seems to stretch on for miles. The walls rise above us like giants, separated by at least half a mile. Every step echoes for an eternity, and we notice all of the offices and workspaces ended on the first couple of floors, like none of the Iraqis wanted to go any deeper. We finally hit the bottom of the staircases, which lead to a large steel door. To our right we hear a loud groan, and what sounds like chains moving. I ask the plant manager what the sound is, and he responds, nothing. We do not go there. I tell him I'll fuck him up if there are prisoners being mistreated down there. As I go to investigate the wall, trying to find a door, I don't see one. Just the smooth concrete that keeps the river at bay. I turn to the building manager and threaten to beat his ass until he shows me where the door is. He finally obliges and slides a section of the concrete out, which is hiding a large metal door. 
He begs us not to go in, telling us he wishes us no ill will, or some shit like that. I finally force him through the door and tell him he's going to have to have a bad day if people are chained down there. He turns the key and the lock making a grinding noise that echoes throughout the dam. The door groans as he slowly pushes it open. A large gust of wind hits me, forcing me to step back to regain my balance. We step into an unfinished tunnel. The wall's much rougher than the rest of the dam. It looks like they started working on it and then gave up. He flips the switch which turns on a dim red light which makes the tunnel glow a hellish red. And those sounds, those fucking sounds. It sounds like a large groan, the kind of groan you only hear from someone in agony. And then chains shuffling across the ground. We place the building manager up front and wedge out within the massive tunnel. We could have driven a tank down the tunnel, it's massive. The sounds emanating are so loud that we think we're going to see loads of prisoners any second. But they never appear. We just keep walking. The tunnel grows less finished as we walk until it becomes just granite. We begin to see symbols on the walls that possess a golden glow. I seriously think I'm tripping balls at this point. I don't have a fucking clue what's going on and my guys they are all uneasy. There is this feeling of evil all around. I start to feel nauseated and I'm sweating profusely. It's not normal for Force Recon Marines to clam up on a mission. We're just overwhelmed with dread. These ancient foreign symbols seem to multiply as we get deeper. We have our mag lights attached to the end of our rifles now, and the lights are bouncing along the walls, jerky movements, as we're just waiting to get lit up in an ambush. We finally enter this massive cavern. It looks like a perfect dome, and those symbols are all over the fucking place. I hear the ear splitting sound of chains being moved to my right, and all of us pause in terror as we see what we thought was a massive boulder begin to shift. My flashlight hits what looks like feet as I slowly raise it higher. It's alive and absolutely fucking huge. Sitting down, head in its hands. It's humanoid but must be at least 50 feet tall. It's wearing only a black robe, dark as a shadow. Its hands shift, head rises as it stands. Chains that look like they should be attached to a ship's anchor clang off of the floor, glowing the same golden colour as the symbols. As this thing stands, massive wings spread from its back, filling the entire cavern. It looks down at us, face hidden from the robe and shadows, and all that I can see are fluorescent blue eyes staring at us from under the robe. They only emit agony, rage and disdain. This thing fucking speaks to us. Why are you here? My time has not come. It bellows. Its voice shakes the dam and knocks us all backwards. We remain on the ground, terror running through our bodies. I want to raise my rifle, but I can't move. My heart feels like it's going to burst through my chest. Then chaos and shoes. Two of the marines closest to this thing start attacking each other. They're in pure rage, like animals. They're swearing and yelling at each other, hitting each other with the weapons. Finally, one raises his rifle and shoots the other in the face. His blood and brains splatter all over my face and chest. The marine then sticks his M4 in his mouth and pulls the trigger, his head exploding like a firework. The angel speaks again. He has not let me loose. He has not yet let me loose. You will leave now if you do not want to be part of the one third. My time has not yet come. We grab the dead marines and move as fast as we can back through the dam. Guys are shaking, a couple of them are crying. These elite warriors are stripped away of everything that makes them a marine. No bravery, no honour, and no discipline. We take an elevator up. All that I can think about is a giant hand reaching through and crushing me. I have my dead marine all over my shoulder, blood and brain matter dripping to the floor. I'm praying and begging to God that we make it to the top. We finally make it to the entrance, bursting through the door and into the sunlight. I do my debrief with a commander who thinks I'm crazy. Half my team is having an emotional breakdown as the corpsmen try to calm us down. The commander calls it in and gives me a weird look like he was told something he didn't expect to hear over the radio. A load of spooks and civilians that looked like scientists showed up and went into the tunnel. 
I was told to never speak of it again, and we moved on to our next mission, leaving a dam with a marine unit that took the prisoners from us. I don't know what came of those scientists that went down. I just know that the angel chained under the dam was not one of the good ones. It had this effect on people. It turns us into rabid maniacs lusting for blood. The horror and feeling of evil were similar to the Nefs, but all of that was drowned out by unbridled rage. Half the squad that went down there never recovered. They either killed themselves or ended up in mental wards. The only thing I've ever been able to come up with is the biblical reference to the four angels that will be chained until the tribulation. They'll be unleashed and one third of the world will die. Maybe these things will bring the worst out of humanity. Maybe they will force people to kill each other like animals. All that I really know is that I hate that fucking thing. It killed two great marines and drove five others crazy. There have been stories that have since come out of that dam. Iraqi prisoners were held there. The marines have spoken of the fear the Iraqis have of that place. They complain of a beast that lives under the dam. Even the marines would draw straws before making rounds. I just hope this thing dies and rots in hell. Why can we now see it? Is it about to be released? David looks at me and says, That was the first of four wings. Are you ready for the other three? Wow, fantastic stuff there on that wonderful series. Hugely successful so far. Um, a lot of opinions and uh, a lot of discussions coming about from this series. Thank you ever so much once again to Mizu Ranger. Do take time to check out his Reddit. I'll leave a link to that in the description box below. And as ever, guys, above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.